This is an ABC News special report. Queen Elizabeth II, the legacy, the life. Now reporting, David Muir. Good morning, everyone, and we're coming on the air this morning for what will be a truly somber yet majestic moment, the coffin carrying Queen Elizabeth II is about to leave Buckingham Palace for the final time. The procession will now take her coffin from the palace to Westminster Hall, where she will lie in state for four days until her funeral at Westminster Abbey on Monday. It will take 38 minutes to complete the route from Buckingham Palace to Westminster, arriving at about 10 a.m. Eastern. That's 3 p.m. London time. They're five hours ahead, of course. Her coffin will journey through central London. It will take in the Queen's Gardens, uh, the Mall, Parliament Square, uh, to the Palace of Westminster. Often now, as you can all see at home, the procession from Buckingham Palace, leaving for the final time, heading to Westminster Hall, draped in the royal standard, as you can see there, and placed atop the coffin there, the imperial state crown on a velvet cushion. And to read the flowers there, we have taken note of those flowers every step of the way, many of them uh, from Balmoral, symbolic the Queen's love for nature. Victoria, that crown carries a lot of history. She wore it often all the way back to her uh, days of coronation, after the coronation on her trip from Westminster to the palace. It does indeed. It's a very powerful symbol of the British monarchy there. Part of the crown jewels which are kept in the Tower of London when they are not in use. But this is a crown that we do see in use. As you say, the Queen wore it at the end of her coronation when she left Westminster Abbey. It's not the crown that the Sovereign is crowned with. That's the St. Edward's crown. This is the one that is worn afterwards. And also, it is worn at the state opening of Parliament, something we have seen the Queen do so many times throughout her reign. So a real sense of history, but also a familiarity with that crown that we see on top of her coffin now. 
and more powerful than even the crown. Those images of the family walking behind King Charles, obviously uh, his sons, uh, Prince William, now the Prince of Wales, Prince Harry as well, and Robert Jobson also watching us with us this morning, our royal contributor, Robert. Uh, impossible to overstate the significance of the family behind the coffin, uh, and in particular, William and Harry, given so much attention on them, uh, this solidarity for their grandmother. Well, David, I think it's been very important that that solidarity has been shown by William and Harry, support of the king, but in mourning of the queen. This is the final time as they leave Buckingham Palace and get, make this this route, uh, this uh, this route to Westminster Hall. This, this is the last time they're handing over the private time that they've had with the Queen, and she now becomes public property, if you like. This is when they're handing over to be Queen of the Nation, and all those people will be able to file past her coffin at Westminster Hall. So it must be a very poignant moment for the King and all of his family, you see them there marching. It seems odd to me, actually, that Harry and the Duke of York are not in military uniform when they are actually the only two amongst all those guys in uniform that have actually served on the front line, but they're wearing their campaign medals and they're doing the right thing by the king. I know for many here in the United States watching uh, Robert, can't help but to think of William and Harry as young boys following behind their mother. And we know now, and looking back at history, it was the Queen who privately, for many days, comforted her grandchildren. And now to watch them uh, as grown men following behind the Queen, the grandmother they loved so much. Well, it was the Queen that really did put that arm around them when they were in Balmoral, when they heard the news of the death of Diana and their grandfather, the late Duke of Edinburgh, took them walking in the hills to help them clear their heads. But those memories of them walking behind the coffin of the, the late prince are still, are still with us now. And Harry has talked recently about it haunted him, actually, for many, many years. But here, those they were boys then, all those years ago, 25 years ago. But they're very much men now. William, 40 years old, Harry approaching 40. And it's absolutely right that they're marching behind their commander-in-chief and their grandmother and the queen of the country. Victoria, you can hear the bells toll as well. It must be quite moving uh, to be there in person. Silence along this route, with the exception of the bells tolling on this procession. It is very moving, David, to be standing here watching that coffin come past. And as we anticipated, the crowds, unlike last night where they cheered, there is a silence and a real stillness among the crowds today. It feels like perhaps more than ever before, we now feel that the country has paused, the country has stopped in this moment of quiet reflection. I saw there someone from the crowd throwing a single rose out towards the coffin. You can see people just looking at one another, sort of in disbelief that we are now taking in this truly historic moment, which I think has personal resonance for so many as well. right there, King Charles III, followed behind by the now heir to the throne, uh, Prince William. Obviously, he was an heir before this moment, but now he's even closer to that role one day. Now, the Prince of Wales, uh, Kate, the Princess of Wales. And we should note that King Charles, and you have seen this in some of this uh, imagery this morning, walking beside his siblings, and one sibling in particular, uh, Princess Anne, who 
doesn't get a lot of attention, but is known as one of the hardest, if not the hardest working royal. She has been with her mother on this final journey from Scotland, uh, then flying to London, and now this final 38 minute journey to Westminster. And I just wanted to share with you this uh, line, this statement that she released. And again, it was rare for Princess Anne to put something out uh, public in this way. But she said of all of the people along the journey, and there you see her to the right of your screen, she said, we may have been reminded how much of her presence and contribution to our national identity we took for granted. And she said, I am so grateful for the support and understanding offered by my dear brother Charles as he now accepts the added responsibilities of the monarch. Charles there, Princess Anne, Princess Andrew and Edward, uh, William and Harry next to each other, uh, their cousin, obviously, uh, Peter Phillips also marching with Duke of Gloucester, the Queen's cousin, Lord Snowden, Margaret's son. Uh, they're just behind uh, Prince Harry and Prince William there. And of course, Princess Anne's husband, Sir Timothy Lawrence, also part of this procession. Ian Panel talking about the mood of the nation, largely silent, but the spontaneous applause along the route, people unsure what to do, and understandable. Those who welcomed King Charles at Buckingham Palace for the first time, singing God Save the Queen, and then breaking into God Save the King. And it was moving overnight when the Queen returned home to Buckingham Palace. Again, silence, followed by spontaneous applause and cheers for their queen. But look at the faces there, and I think that says it all. People holding their phones and wiping their tears on this journey. A sense of community uh, in London and across the United Kingdom and bidding farewell to the Queen. We saw just moments ago Amy Robach, uh, the Queen consort, Camilla, uh, and Kate, now Princess of Wales, of course a title not used since Diana, uh, leaving the palace. We also know Duchess Meghan, part of the convoy of cars now, making their way over Westminster. Uh, extraordinarily powerful to see the Queen consort uh, and the Princess of Wales making their way to Westminster. It certainly is, and David, as we hear the cannons firing and Big Ben tolling, it is remarkable to think about, yes, all of the people who have come out uh, from the beginning in Balmoral, winding through those Scottish country roads to pay respects to the Queen and then through the streets of Edinburgh. I have to say, we um, actually flew back or flew towards London almost coinciding with the Queen's coffin, and it was remarkable to be in Edinburgh Airport. When her coffin arrived, it was being transported out by uh, the Royal Air Force on a big cargo jet, a C-17. There was a two-minute moment of silence in a very busy airport. Everyone stopped what they were doing, and then uh, we're hearing, it's pretty remarkable when you think about the interest, not just in this nation, but around the world, just to be a part of history. and to watch and witness this all unfold, their uh, flight tracking website. Six million people tuned in one minute after that C-17 plane took off from Edinburgh Airport to head here to London just to track the Queen's coffin, to track that flight into London, and then to see this incredible pomp and ceremony and to see the unity 
of the royal family. That's not something we have seen in recent years. So it is remarkable and heartwarming to all of these people who have been watching and lining the streets and waiting overnight in the rain and that famous London weather to witness not only the Queen's coffin passing, but to witness this royal family come together as a family and show that familiar, familial spirit that has been missing. So this is really a unifying moment uh, as well as a somber one. And there we see the images of the Queen Consort and Princess Kate and the rest of the caravan heading towards Westminster now as well. Amy, thank you. At TJ Holmes, we know Queen Elizabeth II will lie in state for four days until uh, Monday, which is the day of her funeral. Robin and I will be there with all of you as we report and carry the funeral for our, our viewers back here in the United States. And the people of London have been told it could be many, many hours in line to pay their respects to the Queen. They're, they're told, David, it could be 30. And for many of the people we talk to here, um, they will tell you she gave us a lifetime of service. I can give her a few hours in line to pay respects for just a few seconds. And you all, you've been talking about juxtapositions and heard Ian talking about emotions. Well, the juxtapositions step out, or really just jump out to me now, because yesterday was, it rained all day here, all day in London, uh, when she came back and made that final journey. And we heard that quiet applause, uh, uh, that spontaneous applause that broke out. Well, today, quiet, solemn, som somber, but it is an absolutely beautiful day here in London today. And we, we sit here, and, and David, we're actually sitting on the same set that was set up for us just a few months ago. And behind us was Buckingham Palace. The Queen was stepping out on that balcony. And, you talk, and Ian was talking about Brits don't like to show their emotions. Well, that was the extreme, uh, exuberance. It was exhilarating, it was exciting. And here we are now, behind us, Westminster Abbey, where that same woman who was on that balcony, her funeral is going to take place. And just a totally different Britain right now. And so we've seen the extremes um, here and experience it in a lot of ways, David, and those, those things stand out to me. And, and Princess Anne's uh, statement, right, saying that uh, we maybe took for granted what she meant to us. And talking, I spoke to you about it last night in a special report, that 18-year-old young lady, when I asked her what the queen meant to her, she said, she didn't mean anything to me, really. I'm 18, I didn't think anything about it until I start seeing these tributes. And she admitted herself that she took for granted until this moment what this queen meant to her. Robert and I were talking moments ago about the Queen's plans. Now, every part of this journey was crafted in part and certainly approved of by the Queen. We were talking to James Longman a moment ago, and I want to bring James back in because he's standing in the crowds of people who are lined up already and have been, many of them, overnight for a chance to honor the Queen as she lay in state for four days until her funeral once she arrives at Westminster. It will be um, quite powerful, James, to watch, and, and I know that they are predicting historic crowds, perhaps the largest crowd ever, to honor a sovereign. Yes, this is, frankly, David, the biggest event in British history. It must be. I mean, it's, it's just an absolutely colossal undertaking for so many people to descend on the capital to be part of this moment. Um, authorities believe something in the region of 400,000 people are going to want to view the Queen as she lies in state at the Palace of Westminster, which is just over the river from where I am now, Westminster Hall, thousand-year-old hall 
where she will lie in state. Um, these people I'm stood here with now, they're towards the front of the queue. Uh, many of them have been here uh, overnight trying to get uh, at least a head start uh, on what will be, or has already been for them, a, a very long wait. But what they've tried to do, the authorities, is foster a sense of community along the way. And so uh, the, the line has actually been divided up as it goes down the, the River Thames. It's going to last possibly for something like 30 hours for those who are joining at the end, some three miles down this river. But all along the way, there are stewards. Uh, there are faith stewards. Uh, people here are, yes, waiting in line for an event, but they're also in mourning. I've been watching, very, very moved to watch uh, a group behind me here watching the procession on their mobile phones, sharing uh, one phone among a group. Uh, they don't know each other. With tears in their eyes watching this happen, because they feel very much like this is a moment where they're going to see a family member uh, lying in state. It's, it's not just uh, the leader of the nation, not just the monarch, not just the queen, but someone who they feel very, very personally connected to. Many of the people who are lining up here are actually in mourning clothes. Um, and so for them, this is an incredibly somber moment. And uh, we've heard it time and time again. I don't mind waiting 10, 12, 15, maybe 30 hours. She was our queen for 70 years. family, led by the new king, King Charles III, behind his mother. And Victoria, as we heard Robert saying there, the history of this moment and what the queen helped uh, the people of the, the United Kingdom usher in all of the changes along the way to think that when she began, you know, Winston Churchill, Harry Truman, and all of the U.S. presidents that she met met since then, the famous images, uh, the dancing with Gerald Ford, the riding horseback with Ronald Reagan, uh, dinners, high tea with the Clintons, dinners with the Obamas and former President Trump. She witnessed so much change and as a head of state, she made sure that that relationship with the United States remained very strong. She absolutely did so many historical moments there with the Queen and US presidents throughout the years, absolutely. And I think it's incredibly poignant, as you say, Winston Churchill was her first prime minister. And then just two days before she died, she brought in her 15th prime minister, who turned out, of course, to be her last. I think you speak about her relationship with the US there, her relationship with countries all over the world and this incredible visibility that she had globally. She visited more than 100 countries throughout her reign, formed those personal relationships. And we see even in her death just how visible she still planned to be. I think when she came back to Buckingham Palace here last night in that state hearse, it was lit up, it was dark, but the hearse was lit so that people could see her coffin. We see this long, slow procession today, giving more people the opportunity to come and catch a final glimpse of the woman whose motto was, I have to be seen to be believed. Barra party. Six paces, outwards, march. Back still. Barra party, prepare to turn. Prepare to race. Race. Barra party, inwards. Turn. Barra party. Prepare to turn. Turn. Barra party. Slow. March.
Elizabeth II. Now in Westminster Hall, where the people of the United Kingdom, the people of London will be able to pay their respects. The family, as you can see, this is our first time seeing images of the extended royal family gathered there at Westminster. The choir of Westminster Abbey and the choir of His Majesty's Chapel Royal, St. James Palace, are singing uh, Psalm 139 as the Queen entered Westminster. The Queen's children now joined behind the coffin. You can see Queen Consort Camilla at King Charles III's side. Victoria, extremely powerful to see the family together now.